Welcome to The Ruddle Show. I'm Lizette, and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. Today we wanted to start off, well, I wanted to start off talking, asking you something about documentation. Is that okay? Sure. Because the other day you said something to me that got me thinking. You said that you wouldn't be where you were today without all the documentation you did. And by documentation, we mean all the detailed notes, the radiographs, the photographs that you did on each patient. So... At first, I thought you meant that you wouldn't have all the great content for your lectures, for all of your teaching, Mm. but that isn't, that is not what you meant. You, (laughs) could you tell us what you meant by that and why you think documentation is one of the secrets of your success? Sure. Um, I used to play a lot of sports, uh, in sports, even back in the fifties and sixties, they, some coaches did take some films. Maybe it was a handheld camera and a still image, but they would show you uh, your stance or your step up in the bucket or, you know, for, anyway, in different sports, there's different things. So I learned as a kid how important to, it is to go back after the game's over and see what you might have done and how you can get better. So it was pretty natural for me to take a few pictures. Uh, I should probably tell you in the old days, it was uh, 36 uh, slides, I think, in a packet. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, anyway, a film, like it was not, yeah, we didn't just have the iPhone. (laughs) No. So, you know, we would take all these pictures and sometimes you'd see things you'd never saw in your life. And we would have a race to get down to color services where it was developed overnight. And the next morning I'd roll in there at seven or six 30 in the morning, grab my packet, race to the office. My staff would come around and sadly we put a waste basket. Nope. Nope. No, 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 no. And there might be two or three that I could use in my lecture, but I realized this is really important stuff. Well, what happened as we got to digital cameras, we could see if we got the shot right at the moment. Uh, I began to evaluate my surgical cases, uh, how I took a post out or what I did when I did a broken instrument, uh, clean shape pack, different things, perilouses, a dark tooth, uh, swellings. Anyway, I got the staff involved I didn't have to, at at some point, I didn't do any documentation. They did it. I just kept working. So the patient wasn't really inconvenienced. I wasn't inconvenienced, but I had the benefit when everybody went home and it was quiet, and it might be three days later, three weeks later, I could go back and look at that case. And I saw lots of things Ruddle needed to get better on. Uh, There was a lot of little things that I could do better. I saw I missed some things. And then I just saw the aesthetics of it all. And from a teaching standpoint, how to get a point across, maybe a film right here, we're always waving our arms and trying to chalkboard it, but maybe we could just show it and then they would see it. So documentation had a lot to do with my success. I had a fabulous team, obviously. I had family support, but the documentation allows you to grow. I think you also said um, at one point too, I've heard you say that it helped you see what was maybe missing as technologically, like what you might, what how you might have benefited from some innovation or invention that could have helped you. Well, when you're documenting, suddenly in the quietness of the room, the film room, you are looking at things and you're going, if I just had that, I could have, I could have done that more successfully or easier or easier, faster, better versus not at all. So it did help me a lot with some of the inventions I've done across the years just to see how things really are. There's what we think and then there's what is. I've also, when I've seen your lectures, I've seen that you have oftentimes five-year recalls, 10-year recalls, and I've seen even up to 30-year recalls. And when I had a root canal several years back, um, I got called in five years later to come in for a recall visit. And I, at first I didn't come in because I'm like thinking, well, there's nothing wrong. My tooth is doing well. So why would I need to come back in? But then I felt guilty because I remember mm-hmm. how much you valued those recall um, radiographs you had and how they, they're they great in your lecture. So then I felt guilty. I went back. So how did you get patients to come back in? Bribery. <laughs> well, no, I think I would say quickly, um, I would say that it all starts when the patient walks into the office. In other words, people aren't going to come back. They don't even want to be there. And they're probably there because they're hurting and in the donics anyway. Most of our patients have some complaint. So to have them come back when they first come in the office, we need to be get into relationship, make connections that are humankind. Uh, people like people like themselves. Ask an unscripted question. 
uh, get them talking a little bit. Well, all of a sudden you're friends. So when you tell them how important it is and you've explained the cases you're going along, they're part of the treatment. They're co-treatment with you. So it's not just me doing the treatment, they're helping me. So uh, the, I would ask them at the end, you know, we're going to have a recall. You'll get a postcard. Don't be panicked. Don't concern. Just, just drop by. Take 10 minutes of your time. Well, a lot of people would because they liked me and I liked them and I had those relationships. But I would say maybe 30 or 40 percent didn't. And so then we'd have the receptionist call. A very powerful one was having the assistant that sat with them during the procedure have them call, you know, when it's convenient, they can have a little conversation and get the patient in. And then, of course, back to bribery. That always seemed to help. Uh, we would give gift cards maybe to Starbucks, uh, maybe to a restaurant or whatever to make them realize it was important, make it fun. And we all had fun. They got a nice dinner. I got the case. And, you know, after surgery, just in closing, one last thing about documentation, that's what led to 48-hour suture removal. I mean, we were leaving those sutures in for seven days, and then we were taking healing shots post-op, seven days, 30 days. But when you start taking sutures out of 48 hours, people said you can't do that. Well, we showed them you can, and the healing was fabulous. Well, great. Okay. It sounds like it's important to get the staff involved. That I got that. because Absolutely. And, and to get people to come in, just be persistent. All right, well, we have a great show for you today, so we're gonna get started. a new segment we have called Profiles in Dentistry. Every now and then we want to present a clinician who has really devoted his or her life to making a difference in dentistry and helping others. And we want to talk about this clinician in terms of the four facets of the Ruddle Show, education, innovation, community, and lifestyle. Mm. Today, we want to present to you a Dutch cl clinician, Dr. Rick Van Mill, who you have seen on a previous show um, on, his, on his boat talking about COVID-19. And also in a music segment we had last season, you saw Rick playing guitar. So you've known Rick for, for several decades. Do you remember how you met him? I do. Um, you know, we were giving seminars for several decades, but in 1990, I believe, roughly, uh, we, you know, it was an international class and that was pretty normal, people from all over the world. And uh, I just knew that he was going to be coming. I didn't know he was coming with his wife, Wilma. And so I knew he was coming, but I guess what stands out is he arrived on, they arrived on bicycles. <laughs> I'll let you go into that more. Oh, no, you tell us. You tell the story. Well, OK, so Wilma says that Rick likes to be completely mentally free and cleansed so he can really dive into the educational knowledge and swim vigorously. So they flew from uh, Amsterdam to San Francisco and then they had their bikes shipped and they got on their bikes with saddles and a uh, little backpack. And they came down the coast, Highway 1, and you know how beautiful that is, Monterey, Big Sur, Carmel, all that stuff. And then they arrived for the course. So I met them as uh, on the first day of the course, uh, we had breakfast, which was normal. So they came out to the office with a van, but Wilma was with him and was with him the whole course. And that's how I met uh, them. Okay, so Rick lives and practices in Amstelveen, which is in the Netherlands. And he's married to, you said, a great woman, Wilma. Like Wilma's to Rick, kind of like how mom is to you, like the backbone of the operation. So now it's we're true. gonna show a little video and it's narrated by Wilma and it shows where Rick, Rick practices in Amstelveen. So let's look at that now. Okay. Hi, this is our first introduction video of Rick and Wilma Van Mill from the Netherlands. Our dental office 
is located south of Amsterdam in Amstelveen, which is actually a suburb from the big city. We are surrounded by this little green park, which gives a very nice and relaxed atmosphere. Today it's 15th of February, so actually it's midwinter, but because of the sun is shining, it feels almost like it's a spring day. You hear the birds singing, it's a beautiful day. So what do you think of that? Well, Location. it brought back a lot of memories. I've never been to his office, but I've been to Amsterdam many times as a clinician lecturing, and I've had dinner with him. And I remember one course years ago, uh, it was the first microscope assisted course in all of Europe, and I was a keynote speaker. And I remember walking along the canals after the lectures and walking to some great restaurants, and then Phil's and I have been back. And so, yeah, it brought back a flood of memories. It looks like a really nice location to practice, and apparently he's been at that location since 1982. Now Wilma's gonna take us up to the front door of the office, so let's look at a little bit more. Oh, awesome. So I cross over this little bridge, and then I'm in front of our office. You cannot see me because I'm filming, but later I will introduce myself, and I'm going inside now where Rick is teaching a seminar of endodontics, of course. And in a small setting, we have now eight dentists today and tomorrow. Today is Thierry and tomorrow he's doing a live demo on a patient and afterwards a hands-on training. So you can't help but notice the bikes that were parked out front. So biking is obviously pretty big in the Netherlands, but he's also giving a course and he's taking courses from you, right? Yes, Rick, uh, as you mentioned, 1990 was our first interaction. That was a, a two day course. What we didn't say is that he came back multiple times to take two day courses. But then he started coming back and taking my week-long course because I offered a week-long course for international people so they didn't have to transfer back and forth over the oceans. So it was a more convenient and efficient with their time. And in recent years, he even came to actually help out in the courses. Well, he kept coming. And finally, after he'd taken every course, Rick, I don't need to say you're a slow learner, do I? <laughs> But no, he, he was just passionate about endodontics. So he came over and over and over. And finally, when he signed up again and the credit card information came through, I said, this is embarrassing. <laughs> and I said, you will never pay another dime for Ruddle's education. But what you can do, since you still want to come, is I'm going to put you to work. <laughs> so I told Rick, when you come over, you're actually going to be a body among the dentist and you're going to actually work with them chair side. Uh, you're going to help him. And so we worked for many more years uh, where he came over as faculty. I went down, I was the chairman at the Scottsdale Center for Dentistry, and I had a, a faculty that supported me. He was one of them that came there. Then when we moved the seminar business back to Santa Barbara, he kept coming. Uh, we actually have um, some footage of Rick teaching his course. He's teaching it in Dutch. So, but let's look at that now. Okay. Here Rick is teaching his seminar on endodontics in our coffee room. Did you understand what he was saying? My Dutch is perfect. <laughs> I'm, I'm fluid in many, many languages, uh, English and English and English would be the top three. Um, 
Well, I'm really proud of Rick because, you know, Rick uh, got, he's a skillful clinician. Okay. You have to have some skills, but then he had desire. He had a big passion and he was able to grow. And I watched him grow. He sent me lots and lots of cases um, that I would review. And I just saw his, his journey as ascension. And so he wanted to know one day if, if uh, since I can't go over so often, could he start a class? And I gave him encouragement. He said, but, but I'm a general dentist. I said, there are no endodontists. There are no general dentists. There's just students of endodontics, mm -hmm. people who want to learn. So if you have nothing to offer your colleagues, they won't come. You don't have to worry. The decision will be made for you. But if you have something to offer and you can make people more successful, uh, they'll come. And if they come, you and Wilma have work to do. So he's been offering these group classes now. People are coming from all over Western Europe and maybe even a little bit beyond. It looks like he kind of has modeled his courses a little bit in the same way that you did, except for you never did a live demo on a patient in one of your seminars. But um, he, we actually have footage of him doing the live demo. So let's see that. Oh, okay. So here Rick is doing his live demonstration on the real patient. Everyone's watching. Yeah. We also do a video, so they can also watch it on the video. And the other half of the group is watching this in our waiting room by the video screen. And one of the colleagues who has been here before is explaining what Rick's are is doing. So I think we, we should say right now he's doing an endodontic course, but in his office they do pediatrics, periodontics, implants, aesthetic dentistry, and even orthodontics. Multidisciplinary dentistry. Mm -hmm. So I guess that is more common in Europe to do that. Yeah, I don't have time right now to explain, but uh, historically, when groups started coming over, even in the 80s to Santa Barbara, uh, they went home and did everything, like you just said. There really weren't, there. if there were, there was a handful of trained specialists in all of Europe. Now that's all changed. Uh, Europe has, has closed the gap. They have post-grad programs and you can go there and train to, and get certified to be an endodontist. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're right, uh, It's it was normal for even your master clinicians to do crowns, mm -hmm. follow-up crowns and stuff like that. And they also have quite an international office too. I think they have um, a Japanese doctor there, an Indian doctor there. Yep. So they, and they speak like multiple languages in that office they as well. Speak, uh, Dutch, English, Japanese, uh, Hindi, and Urdu. And and that's just because of how uh, multi-ethical Amsterdam is. And in uh, Amstelveen, the, the little town they live in, there's a big Japanese population there, apparently. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we have one more video clip that we're going to show you, and it's kind of reveals a little bit about Rick's lifestyle. So it involves a luncheon that's being prepared for the course attendees. So let's see that video now. So here we have the lunch upstairs in our living room actually. And it's a vegan lunch, very healthy with lots, lots of fruits and vegetables and nice rolls. And this is Mimi. Can I look? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Mimi is helping me with the lunch and she's doing a great job. So. I'm going downstairs now and I'm telling them that lunch is ready. And there's my little sweetie doggy Luffy, poopy. So I did notice a few things that stood out to me. One is that Rick is a vegan and I know that you've talked to him about that before. It, apparently it looks like he lives right above where he works so that's nice and then we also got to meet Rick's dog and I think it's pronounced Luff but yeah and he, he loves that dog both him and Wilma love that dog they actually got that dog in one of their visits to Santa Barbara to take in night classes uh, they arranged why they were over here to get that dog and that dog then flew home with them in the same plane and they have been inseparable since then. <laughs> One thing I'd like to say to the group, 
um, you're starting to notice that uh, how you practice and what you put around you is a choice. And did you see the technology in his operatory? He had a pro ergo, he had buggy whip over the patient delivery, he had side delivery. I mean, it gets you excited. So for all you general dentists out there, you know, uh, you can be as good as you decide. And if you get a little bit of technology around you, you can do some really great things. What else do we got? Well, we also want to talk a little bit about um, Rick's uh, journey because he hasn't just always stayed right there in that office. Well, I mean, that office has been there since 1982, but he's also gone out on some charity type missions to um, bring some dental care to underprivileged people and help out in, in these communities in Nepal and Oman. So I they, there's I saw some pictures on his website. I'm going to try to get those and hopefully we can show you those like over what we're saying. But do you know anything more about that? I think that's really interesting that he's gone to these faraway places and, and helped teach there you and know, do dentistry on people who can't afford it. Wilma and Rick have the biggest hearts and they're very successful and they've always, I've always understood without even hardly talking about, they need, they feel obligated to give back. So when they went to Nepal, they, that was more children. So they helped a lot of kids and they flew in there and they'll work for uh, two or three weeks at a time. But the one that was also intriguing was when they went to the deserts of Oman and they talked about the desert dentistry and um, got to do some endodontics there. Whereas with the kids, there's a lot of times just caries, clean outs and palliative treatment. But they have done that many years and they talk about the camels, the culture and how wonderful, how beautiful the people are. Well, I, I thought that was just really like inspiring to me. That's one of the reasons why when we were even going to choose someone to do our first segment on profiles in dentistry, I really wanted to, you know, present Rick because of that work he's done in other countries. I thought that was really inspiring. And speaking of how interesting he is, tell us about what's next because well, he didn't always he wasn't always a dentist, was he? Apparently he used to be a civil engineer who made calculations for drilling platforms in the North Sea. And I was actually reading a magazine article um, that told me about that. It was a magazine article on Rick. And it had a quote that Rick gave that I wanted to read because I thought it was really interesting. Oh, neat. He said, in our clinic, we always start with the pillars, healthy roots. We use these as a basis to build something that will last a long time. You could compare it with a drilling platform. It would be nothing without a strong and solid foundation. Wow. You know, Rick, one night we were having dinner and I don't know how many beers we'd had, but uh, he was telling me about the thrill of erecting a platform in the North Sea. Now, the North Sea is some of the wildest waters on earth. So he sits in his office and he does all the engineering. It's all supposed to theoretically work. But he said, he was obligated to go out and set the platform up. And the biggest move was towing it out horizontal and then deploying it so it came up vertical. And when that moment arrived, he said it was really thrilling. Well, that's that's our end of our segment on um, Rick Van Mill, but we, he is gonna be, you'll be seeing him on some future shows and specifically when we talk about um, laser disinfection. Oh, good. Yes, he has swoops. Okay, and you, you already pointed out that he had a lot of technology in his office. And I did read um, that they had actually at one point maybe considered relocating their office, but they decided to save money because they wanted to invest in, in the latest technology and just, um, just be a very high technology office. For those of you who don't know what sweeps uh, means, it's it's a laser 2940 ER YAG, and uh, he is teaching that in his classes. So, I mean, he is not just any dentist, he's a super dentist. Well, that's the end of our segment. We, we both love Rick and Wilma, and, you know, I can't wait to see them again soon. But... And they're sailing right now. Right, <laughs> on their boat. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Indo training, that's what I like to do. Indo training is really fun and I've been blessed because groups have come from all over the world and here we have Hideki Namira from Japan who's become quite 
an amazing clinician. We've done a lot of training together in Japan and in Santa Barbara. So speaking of training, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about retreatment today. And specifically, the topic is how to remove gutta percha in the retreatment situation. Now, remember, sometimes we even remove gutta percha when there's no problems. Maybe the dentist needs a restorative effort with a post. So we might take out some gutta percha to make a post space. Or typically, it's to remove gutta percha to reset the case because it's failing. So when you look at this case, I want to just say one quick thing. Uh, I spent a lot of years of my professional life in the world of retreatment. And I've written chapters in at least five textbooks around the world, you know, like 50 pages. So when I look at retreatment, I want you to look at it like I look at it. And I want to look at it like you look at it and together we'll learn. So we're thinking about removing gutta percha, but what you can see in a retreatment case immediately is there's usually more than one issue. So we have a casting, a porcelain fused to metal crown. We see that we're going to have to take a post out. Uh, if you look at the rules of symmetry, the gutta percha is not centered in the root. So there's probably another branch in here. Uh, we got a short fill, okay? So there's gonna be things like blocks, ledges, post removal, extra canals. Those are the issues. And then of course, we have a big furcal blowout. So we're not gonna look at this case right now, but I wanna get you thinking gutta percha removal. Now, there's many ways that I've taught to remove gutta percha. You need to have your bag full of secondary and tertiary tricks. So when we look at removing gutta percha, I think we can identify several different ideas, and I'll go through these very quickly. Of course, the easiest and the most efficient is to use a rotary instrument. And rotary, you know, causes sufficient heat that heat causes friction, the friction causes heat, I should say, and through that heat wave, we begin to soften the gutta percha, load it onto the cutting flutes so we can auger it up out of the canal. So that would be our first choice. But a lot of times the rotary instruments in a very small prepared canal, under prepared canals, the rotary instrument's gonna cut dentin before it starts to auger gutta percha. Remember, when we take out gutta percha, we should be thinking just gutta percha. Shaping's another idea, and we'll do that later. So heat transfer, the limitations with heat is sometimes these electric heat carriers, because of their taper, begin to have restrictions, and you can't plunge them uh, deeper and deeper because our canal's tapered. So as we get down to smaller diameters, or maybe we even have more curvature, maybe we have abrupt curvatures, then maybe this would be considered dangerous. We probably would never get heat devices that deep. So we have to have other ideas. Headstrom displacement is a really effective idea when it's poorly obturated. In other words, sometimes the headstrom can go into the thermal softened gutta percha and pull the whole cone out in one motion, in one move. That's nice, particularly useful when gutta percha is overextended beyond the foramen, like think of the Powell root of a maxillary molar and there might be gutta percha in the sinus, okay? Good way to maybe extract the whole cone. Files and solvents, oftentimes in you know tight canals, uh, very squigs of sealer and gutta percha, insufficient material, we're gonna have to use small sized hand files in the presence of a solvent, like a chloroform or a xylol. Xylol is an excellent solvent and it can be used along with chloroform. I'm gonna use them interchangeably. So files and solvents. The endoactivator can be used with its polymer tips in a big reservoir, this brimful with solvent, and we can throw that solvent so that it can penetrate, circulate, and it can help absorb the gutta percha. It can soften it and put it into solution so it can be subsequently flushed out of the tube. So another idea. And finally, wicking. What is wicking? When you put paper points into a fluid-filled solvent canal, the paper point wicks. It absorbs material that's in solution laterally to central. It pulls things out of cul-de-sacs, fins, webs, and anastomoses, and it gets it into the body of the canal where you can flush it out. So here's some of our ideas. And the paper points, I'll show this in a little bit, but these are our main ideas. 
you oftentimes use several of these ideas in concert. Well, rotary files. You can use any generic file you want that is mechanically driven, but in the ProTaper world, we actually made specifically retreatment files. Notice that we have the 3009, the 2508, the 2007. This is basically working in the coronal part of a canal. This is working in the middle one third, and this is working deeper, maybe into the apical one third. So that's kind of how to think it. This is an active tip. Be aware of that. That's really good for brick hard resin paste. Russian red, how about that one? On the Pacific Rim, we see a lot of brick hard paste that are very hard to get. So the active tip not only is good for gutta percha, but it's also good for other uh, methods that we will try and show a little bit later. Not today, hey, come on. I have a lot to do today to just get you good with gutta percha. So that's a little bit about the files. The thing to add here is maybe consider something like a rotational speed of nine to 1200 RPMs. This is way faster than you would be shaping or preparing canals, but you need that extra speed to create more friction because the byproduct of friction is what? Heat, and heat thermal softens gutta percha. When you look at an X-ray, you can begin to see the width of the shape in two dimensions, like mesial to distal. Of course, you can take CBCT and you can actually get the axial slice and see how much circumferential dent you have. But with the rotational speed, you put it on the gutta perch and you just start spinning. You're gonna use a bigger instrument, like that 3009 will be used in the coronal. Remember, each third is about three to five millimeters. So we're gonna use an instrument that works in the coronal one third. We're gonna use a smaller profile instrument that works deeper into the body of the canal. And then if we still have gutta perch in the apical third, we'll use the smaller instrument to work in the smaller diameter. Should be making sense. So you can see how this ropes and comes out. It's fast, it's efficient. And if we cannot use chemicals, that's a good thing because chemicals soften gutta percha. Gutta percha slurry gets into the fins and eccentricities off the rounder part of canals. And so that just makes it harder to eliminate those uh, precipitates after the bulk of the material has been eliminated. Chloroform or xylol. Watch the paper point come out. So even after we've augured out all the gutta percha, even when the file looks silver, no more pink gutta percha in the flutes, we can still do wicking and we can eliminate a lot of gutta percha off the rounder cross sections of the canal. Lots of flushing, lots of wicking, and off we go to the next case. Heat, touch and heat, system B, calamus, I'm using calamus, didn't supply Serona. I set the temperature at 350, when your finger touches this activating cuff, you're bringing heat to the tip. Uh, I think this is a runaway lecture, so we'll stop for just a second. There's a 30 tip. There is a 5005, and there is a 6006. I'm telling you there's three tips. This might work best, more effectively in the coronal area. You might have to change tips to get deeper and get your heat wave to pass towards the foramen, the terminus. And you might need the smallest tip then to get as deep as possible. But a lot of times, again, in retreatment, we're restricted because many times a failing case has been underprepared and an underprepared canal does not receive all the armamentarium we've talked about. That's why you have to have multiple ideas. Plunge, deactivate the cuff, Take your finger off the circumferential activating cuff on the calamus as an example. Thermal softened gutta percha from calamus accepts a rotary file. The rotary file goes into that thermal softened material even more effectively. And then here we are doing more stuff. You can do ultrasonics. Ultrasonics is another way to produce heat. The byproduct of ultrasonic energy is heat. So some colleagues like to plunge in and make a hole I would probably just use the calamus, but you, I want you to understand this is in the family of heat transfer devices. 
pick the appropriate tip that will fit in the cross-sectional diameter of the orifice. And obviously, because these tips, as they start to get pretty parallel and narrow, they're ineffective and they'll break and they're really expensive. Maybe go back to your calamus and thank calamus. All right. So back to calamus, we can even plunge deeper in the same canal. And once we plunge deeper, that thermal softened wave allows us to what? Take a 30, 35, 40, 45 headstrom that has a cross section of a positive rake angle. The barbs of a headstrom will easily turn into thermal softened gutta percha. You can take the heat and put it right on the instrument. The heat will transfer through the instrument to thermal soften that gutta percha deep. Then you can pack around it a little bit, wind it up, and pop goes the weasel. Very effective way. Headstrom displacement is what I call that uh, about 25 years ago. You can see chemicals are really going to be important because in failures, in cases that are failing, a lot of times the gutta percha might kind of terminate at the junction of the middle and the apical third. Sometimes there's just a squig of sealer in the apical third or maybe a very thin cone and sealer. So rotary's not going to work. Heat transfer is not going to work. Headstrom displacement is not going to work. Ultrasonics is not going to work. You're going to need files and small size files, not a six, not an eight. You need a little bit more rigidity. The rigidity allows you to pick, pick, pick. Look at that. When you pull that file out, the file's clean. No more got to perch it, but believe me, when your file's clean, know with total confidence there's residual remaining got to perch the sealer complex deep. So if we look at a case, what do you look at? I want you to start looking at the cross-sectional diameter of the canal. You got a really big canal here. You got pretty good dimensions here. So you could probably say, well, at least to about this level, I think I can do rotary in the DB and MB. DB and MB, I could probably do rotary quite a bit higher, but kind of make sure when you're using that rotary instrument, you want to see gutta percha. If you're not seeing gutta percha, you're probably starting to cut dentin. Remember, cutting dentin and shaping is completely a different entity than removing gutta percha. I'll say it again. We remove gutta percha crown down. I didn't say that, did I? So let's go over that again. Coronal, middle, apical third. Today's lesson is without drawing it all out for you. Every third is about three to five millimeters. So be thinking about how to get gutta percha out here. Take a small size hand file, okay? 15 is what I like to use, even in a pretty big orifice. And it's pick, 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 okay? It's pick, 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 pick. And it takes a few moments. The gutta percha will start to soften and go down about three, four, five millimeters. You have a pilot hole. Now bring in a 20, a 25, a 30, a 35, and start cutting central to lateral and pretty much remove and eliminate the gutta percha in this region of the canal. Now flush, new, new bath new solvent, and 15 file comes in, and now you can pick a little bit deeper. Three, four millimeters, five millimeters. Now you got another pilot hole. Now go 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. Go up through the size serially and sequentially, and you'll be getting to move gutta percha laterally, but in a controlled depth. When I have everything out of the upper two thirds, I reflush, and now I have a bath full, chamber full, big bath of solvent, and now I'll work my 15 deep. But don't work your 15 deep if there's no gutta percha on the radiograph, okay? If the AP 1 third has maybe never even been entered previously, then maybe your time to get out your sodium hypochlorite and negotiate the terminal diameter, okay? The terminus of the canal. So be sure to crown down, why? If you start softening stuff and try to go all the way up in one big pass, this is when we extrude chemically soften gutta percha and we incite a riot post-treatment. You know, these are patients. We provoke inflammatory responses and that shows up as post-op pain. So I have learned the hard way. When I was a kid, I used to try to go right to length and take it all out. Then I started learning, you know what, do it in a more sequential manner. Your post-op pain, if this is pain and this is time, 
your post-op pain is going to be really low. It's going to be called discomfort. It's going to be called two aspirins. Okay, so now that we have looked thoughtfully and carefully at a preoperative film, we can begin to think about what is the best removal method that we might be able to use here. And if we can stay away from chemicals, I said repeatedly, that would be a good thing. Well, when you get back into these teeth, you know, you can start to anticipate. We know that about 91%, that's clinically, I didn't say histologically, clinically, we know we'll find the famous MB2. So the most common cause of failure in a maxillary molar is failure to find the MB2. But in this case, we have a frank lesion that you can see. The gutta percha is underfilled and underextended vertically. There's still remnants. There's pulp tissue probably still left in this little region, and it's coming out of the end of the foramen, and it's perpetuating the lesion of endodontic origin. So what we have to do is be thankful of the crown down idea, use the bigger rotary instrument here, use a smaller rotary instrument, and then a smaller one. So now you really got it. I'm beating this in because you can do this stuff. Remember, may your reach exceed your grasp. If you're a general dentist out there, if you're an endodontist, you're laughing because you've been taking gutta perch out of teeth for like your whole professional career. But if you're a general dentist, many of them say to me in class work, you know, I'd like to venture into some simple kinds of retreatment because I see a lot of gutta perch of cases that I treated. And I'm not so intimidated by removing gutta percha. I'm leaving the silver points and the broken instruments, the ledge, the blocks, the perfs, the transportations, the post removal. I'm leaving that for you, Cliff. But I can be comfortable, I think, with gutta percha. So I'm talking about things that many of you can do with just a couple ideas. All right, so you find an MB2, and that's another story. This is my first invention. It was a handle, then there was a contra-angle, and we clipped a K-file, a K-file on the end. So when you have a handle, that blocks your vision looking into the access. Then if you grab it with your fingers, you have more obstruction. So we had an offset handle, so we had good vision, and we can snake that in unimpaired, see perfectly, in just a few little strokes, and you have some space, and then that's another lecture. Well, I'm using rotary. I'm using the big one. That would be the 3009. I'm using that in the body of the canal, my primarily upstairs, three to five millimeters. Be sure you see in your mouth mirror, gutta percha spiraling up those flutes and augering ever upward into the pulp chamber. If you're not seeing gutta percha, you're cutting, but you're not doing the right thing in the right sequence. Here we are getting it out of the DB. Notice we've already shaped that canal. It's got a separate apical portal of exit, we're thinking. And then finally the MB comes out. So you just go around the horn with the big one, then drop down to like the medium one. That would be like something like a 2508, if there's room, or even something with less taper, if it needs to be selected so it fits passively within the gutta percha, wall to wall gutta percha. So out with the MB. Well. When you get all the gutta perch out, most clinicians are saying, well, my files are silver, like nitai. Uh, I don't see any residual gutta percha. Flood this with solvent and activate it with the endoactivator. The endoactivator has three sizes of polymers. Choose the one that fits. Listen, you're thinking a polymer will blow up in a solvent. This is Delrin. Delrin is the most pure form of a polymer in medicine. It's used implanted in the body. You can lay a tip in a dappen dish of solvent and it will not distort or melt. I didn't say for two days, but for easily for an hour or two, it'll be intact because it's impervious to absorbing a chemical that would destroy, destroy its physical properties. So this is a great way to move a solvent into all dimensions of the root canal system. Then you can wick it out and pack it. Now remember last season, I ended by talking about vertical condensation. We're gonna talk about carriers and other ideas in this season and the seasons beyond. But notice the hydraulics. Notice when you 
get a heat wave and it goes up that cone, you can get in here with a pre-fit plugger and you can create loads. Look at this, one, two, three portals of exit. Notice we have a bifinity deep. The materials are spiraling across each other. Superimposed, okay. So that's a nice result on this professional volleyball player. I saw this volleyball player after she had had endodontics by an endodontist, okay? So these 45 minute molars are okay if you can do them exquisitely. I don't care how long it takes you to do them, do them well, do them right and grow, get a little bit better. Let's come to our last case. Uh, I could show you many, many cases, but remember, think about this, rotary removal, heat, calamus or ultrasonics, files and headstroms, headstrom displacement, solvents and chemicals, and the endoactivator, okay? These are the ideas. So my friend comes in, he wore a mouth guard. He was a golden boxer, golden gloves boxer out of San Francisco when he was a kid. And he had a lot of trauma, short roots, you can see all that. But he had two root canals, one done in Boston about 1975. And this one was done in Boston in 1974. This was done by endodontist number one, and this was done by number two. So while he was in grad school with me, my classmate, these were both done. And this is my pre-op 30 years later. And I'm now in Santa Barbara and he's in San Francisco. We're both practicing. You can see we have a composite if you look at the incisal edge roughly, and you look at the apex, I'm pretty close to the screen, but about halfway up. So you're gonna have a long access plan carefully. That's my point. And we don't wanna get any bigger this way, right? Because we already have wall limitations in our wall thickness. I noticed we had internal resorption. And that day I didn't know if it had perforated. There was no palpation problems, palatal or facial, but the truth is in the actual clinical performance. So in this case, you're not gonna use chemicals. If you start to soften this, you're gonna get a slurry of chloropercha out into these areas. And how are you gonna ever get that out? So stay away from chemicals, plan very carefully. Be thinking on your pre-op, what's my modus? You could use rotary, rotary might've worked. I thought, why not plunge in here with heat and get a heat wave in that remnant of gutta percha, you know, it's to here and the apex is right in here. So plunge in, plunge in, there's my headstrom, take a plugger and pack the thermal soft and gutta percha to maximize the surface area contact between GP and the instrument and pop goes the weasel. Well, this isn't initially too exciting because this means to me there is a perforation. And it turns out, I'll show you the perforation was facial, okay? Here it is a little bit later in time. I did this in one visit. A little bit later in time means about an hour and a half later. Had perfect hemostasis. We'll talk about that another time. We're just talking about gutta percha. And the idea here was headstrom displacement, no chemicals. And now you can see it's dry. So now I can fit a cone. I can fit a cone. If you wanna squirt some gutta percha, with your syringe laterally into this space. If you wanna throw a supplemental cone in and you know get another cone in here so you can improve your hydraulics. So when you sear this off and you put your plugger here and you push, okay, you'll have the maximum cushion of rubber. And that means you'll deliver 2000 pounds per square inch sealer hydraulics. And I know from my research, the adaptation of gutta percha to dental walls is about on the order of six, seven, eight microns. So we can get wall to wall GP and the sealer interface then is very, very thin. Listen, I've had a lot of fun with you. I hope you've learned quite a bit about removing gutta percha. I hope you lock onto those six principles or methods and be prepared to use them in combination or singularly because remember, you can do it. So that's what I want you to do is learn to train a little bit, think about these things, grow your practice and deliver a higher level of service to your patients.
That's our show for today. We're gonna to leave you with a rare look at some behind the scenes footage so you can see what goes into creating each unique episode of The Ruddle Show. So we'll see you next time. And I promise you, we'll continue to learn more about endodontics together. <laughs> Let's wear them all today. So is this gonna work? <laughs>